BI5 The Cycle of Ignorance. The Process Church of the Final Judgment. New York, August 1968 Communication to All Brethren, Information. What you just heard there was a recitation of the Brethren Information or BIs from a cult of massive significance called the Process Church of the Final Judgment. And that's what this and a series of Insight Analytica episodes are going to be about. So this is Interzone Analysis, and this is part one, an introduction on the Process Church of the Final Judgment. Now, anybody who knows my work regarding satanic organizations and satanism, especially regarding the Order of Nine Angles, a British occult movement that came out of Sophishire, Oxfordshire, and Cambridge in allegedly the 1960s, but the only ever earliest evidence I have is in the 1970s in the UK, which I have done extensive work on. Well, one of the reasons I found the Order of Nine Angles so interesting is they reminded me so much of a British cult that has major influence called the Process Church of the Final Judgment which were the Order of Nine Angles before the Order of Nine Angles. I, they even were in the same area of operation of the early Order of Nine Angles, or O9A, ONA members. And I contacted contacts of mine whom were around from the earliest period in the history of the ONA and asked them if they had any crossing with the process. And as usual, given the enigmatic nature of the ONA, they didn't confirm or deny that statement and allowed me to and they're going to take that to the grave, essentially. However, the process... I've been interested in the process, Church of the Final Judgment, for at least more than 10 years, going through all their material, and if there was any cult I was ever going to join, it was the process. Now, they operated from the UK in the 1960s all the way until around 1979 in America. They are so influential that... And, and nobody knows about them these days. Every major famous person, be it infamous or famous, crossed paths with the process at some point during the 60s and 70s. Um, including Mick Jagger in the early 60s, mid-60s, I'll, I'll go into this. Um, he, he was in one of their process magazines. Also, naturally, um, people don't know, but David Bowie is another person that was associated with the process, Church of the Final Judgment. However, they were mostly his coke dealers, Roman Polanski is another person inadvertently associated with the process. So is Charles Manson and the Manson family, who conspiracy on the process, now, Church of the Final Judgment theorists like to connect Manson with the process. But he is connected 
and I'll go into this later, I'm not coming at this from a conspiratorial angle, and I'm not coming at this from a defensive angle either. Like with my work on the Order of Nine Angles, everything regarding the Process Church or the Final Judgment that is out there is either by what is called Processians. Processians, you know, uh, ex-members of the Process Church. And uh, their material is fantastic, however they are very biased. Because they like to try and make themselves look good, naturally. To deconstruct the conspiratorial, anti-process, satanic panic material. If there's any group that started the satanic panic, it was the process church of the final judgment. And... Like with the ONA in the UK and the ONA in America, any occult group, any cult, splinters off into multiple different cells and fractions that the core people end up losing control over. So if people associated with the teachings do something bad, naturally everyone else associated, even in the most minor way is thrown in with this because people can't seem to come at things from a no more objective and dispassionate angle. However, the Prussians like to disconnect themselves a bit too much and water themselves down because they were hardcore. They in fact, there's so many parallels with the Process Church of the Final Judgment and other satanic organizations. However, the Process is the oldest that I've ever come across of the 20th century, and its influence the most subtle but pronounced out of all of them. That it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of ideas from, I mean, almost everything from both the process, the Order of Nine Angles, and then the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, Kenneth Grant, Typhonian, OTO, it's just a whole nother story, uh, Temple of Set, almost everything comes back to Crowley, Alistair Crowley, uh, English occultist. But most of Crowley's work goes back to the Golden Dawn and to Hermeticism and Kabbalism and the Western esoteric tradition. So Aeonics and all these other theories in the ONA context, the sinister dialectic, essentially maneuvering things to try and push the world into a direction to bring forth a new Aeon. Uh, and this is common in all of these groups. They all, all hermetic occult movements should have a aeonic perspective. And the process simplified things for methadrine crystal injecting 1960s hippies <laughs> into a very interesting way. Um, process was all about bringing forth the apocalypse. It was very inspired by um, a, another English occultist who was associated with Alistair Crowley called um, Robert... Um, hold on one moment. Um, another very influential occultist that... Austin Osman Spare, um, born between in the late 1800s, died in 1956. He was involved with Alistair Crowley. He was a member of the AA, a magical organization founded by Crowley and um, however Austin Osman Spare had very uh, essentially created the chaos magic community 
down the line through his very apocalyptic, very interesting art style and magical writings, which were picked up by an occultist called Ramsey Dukes, very influential um, in the English 1960s-70s chaos magic community. You see, uh, something regarding occult and spiritual movements and cults is if they have a link to magic, everybody is connected to everybody in some way or form. Ramsey Dukes also had his run in with the Process Church of Final Judgment. So did William S. Burroughs, the American amazing writer and author was associated with the process and the process was adopted by later chaos magicians that kind of watered things down a little bit um, the Temple of Psychic Youth by um, Genesis P. Orange who was associated with Burroughs also and uh, But I uh, and um, did a lot of very interesting things in the '90s, especially, and revitalized the process in a sh sense. However, they still watered things down. Now, this all began with Scientology. The Process Church of the Final Judgment was founded under a different name. Essentially, there was a, it was a British established, a British cult. However, the history is uh, two people who called themselves the Amiga when they were process. Um, an English couple, Mary Ann McLean from Scotland, Edinburgh, Scotland, and Robert de Grimston, whom his birth name was uh, also known as Robert Moore, who was born in Shanghai, China. However, his name was changed to have more occult significance. Anyway, they were both Scientologists, and in the 60s, every brilliant person jumped into Scientology, including William S. Burroughs, who was involved in Scientology for more than 10 years. He was cleared, meaning he went through years of auditing. Auditing using e-meters, and, and, and Burroughs went to war with L. Ron Hubbard, but that's a whole other story. Um, so... To give a bit of a timeline, now Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard, <laughs> and what most of Scientology came from the Order Templi Orientis, which of course is an organization associated with Aleister Crowley. Everything splits off from everything, it's very interesting. So to give a bit of a timeline of the Process Church, the two most important figures are Mary and oh, okay, so she wasn't born in Edinburgh, she was born in Glasgow, Scotland. Robert de Grimston, or Robert Moore, born in Shanghai, China in 1935. So she was three years to four years older than him. Now they were known together as the Omega in the cult. Now 1954 to 58, Robert serves military duty with the King's Royal Hussars. Then he starts an architectural course at the Regent Street Polytechnic in London. And this is where someone else important associated with the process, Timothy Wiley, who wrote a book, a very good book, very biased, but very good on the process. Um, he meets Robert at college. Robert de Grimston from 1958 to 62 goes through his first marriage. Then his younger brother in 1960 undergoes Dianetics therapy, so Scientology. Mary Ann joins Scientology in 1961, 
quickly becoming an auditor. Okay, so Marianne McLean was essentially involved in a prostitution ring scandal. She was a high-end escort, from what I know, before joining the Church of Scientology. And it makes a lot of sense. This is the thing, getting information on this that's accurate is quite difficult because the hysteria involved in the process is absolutely ridiculous. And also the um, processians like to... They're very, very English. They like to limit the more unsavory elements of their... There's nothing unsavory about Vida and Escort. Um, she definitely was an escort. She used her... Um, history and sex work to really um, socially engineer things. It's, it's quite amazing. Anyway, back, back to the timeline, it's very important. So uh, she joined Scientology in 1961 and very quickly becomes an auditor. Auditors use the e-meters, the, the um, essentially lie detectors, that are, are, are simplified lie detectors, that would be extremely useful. I'd love to own a e-meter purely for the purposes of self I mean yeah this this is the one thing Scientology does have going for it very well back in the day especially and why a lot of people got involved the e-meter is a fucking genius device to enable yourself to and others to break through certain blockages so trauma And auditors were spe uh, specialists with the e-meter in interrogation, essentially. Because in Scientology, you don't just... And this is very important for understanding the process and why they're so effective and influential. You are using interrogation techniques in the same way that somebody involved in human intelligence uses interrogation techniques. Except you've got them hooked up to a lie detector and they think they're there for a spiritual thing, which they are. To get through trauma, but all this is recorded, of course, and then you're uh, able to be utilized later to blackmail the individual. And all the, But they don't just go through the blockages in this life, they, they go through blockages in past life, too. To become clear, you have to go through everything. And having that device and having a room where somebody is, yeah, pick good auditors are, you are absolutely using, and L. Ron Hubbard was in the Navy and, and U.S. intelligence, most of it came out of the OSS and a lot of the clandestine operation came out of post-World War II U.S. naval intelligence. A lot of intelligence tradecraft in the U.S. at least came out of. It's a very interesting history. And Hubbard is a man that needs more credit given to him because what he created is absolutely genius. And So Robert quits architectural college after three years where he joins Scientology in 62 and meets Marianne. And then they both quit Scientology in 1963. Now, why they quit is they they very quickly... They were the... Robert and, and Marianne... Robert was a very cerebral man, very... intellectual and... Didn't ha he? He was he was very charismatic, but he was uh, extremely charismatic. But he he was very existential and and kind of austere and where uh, uh, Marianne complimented him with his, you know his sort of more enclosed and repressed nature. She. Being a a a ex uh, es escort and a stunningly beautiful woman, she 
knew how to enterprise, she knew how to engineer and build up Robert into bringing out and accentuating his more brilliant qualities. And and he was not somebody that liked the limelight particularly. He didn't stay in the background, but he didn't search for fame. He wasn't a narcissistic personality, sexually inadequate male um, type that you usually get that run the cults. Like the majority of Christian and cults that branch out of Mormon, sorry, Mormon, Mormonism in America that have a lot of pedophilia you know, and all, all, all these very inadequate types to use FBI profiling language. They, de Grimston, he was nothing like the typical cult leader. He was not even like a, Anton LaVey, who was a great entertainer, but he was not uncharismatic. It's just he didn't... She knew how to really build him up, and they complemented each other brilliantly, and they had this equality of... He did a lot of the... Because they built the system together. And then he, he transcribed a lot of the teachings, like one that I was playing in the introduction. Um, and put together... Uh, While well, she put together the, the more practical elements of things, it was... I haven't really seen a cult pull this off before, other than the, the process. And th this started... Uh, yeah, so, so what they did is they were using the e-meters within Scientology, and they went away from L. Ron Hubbard's methods of auditing each other, and started bringing more spiritual matters onto the table. And as they were auditing each other, they were starting to bring in concepts of God and Satan and Christ. A lot of... Uh, yeah, and this, of course, once it was found out, um, what they did is, before completely quitting, they took their e-meters, because they and they started to experiment with Timothy Wiley, who I mentioned earlier, as a guinea pig for therapy sessions with both of them. Because, uh, of course, once you start working on each other, you need to then bring someone else in to test it out, see if it works. And he accepted. This is in 1963. Now, in 1966, Robert and Mary conducted therapy sessions to and formalized their activities under the names Compulsions Analysis. This is the beginning of the process church of the final judgment. Now, they were using e-meters still, and um, when th Things start getting very interesting was in 1964 when Robert and Marianne set up their business in their um, Wigmore Street apartment in London. And then L. Ron Hubbard in 65 um, declares both Robert de Grimston and Mary Ann as suppressive persons for their innovative use of the e-meter. So they, they, if anybody's seen Going Clear, which is an incredibly biased, but at the same time shows what sign what Scient what happens if you label NSP in Scientology it's not a good time so Elwin Hubbard himself um yeah 
And so they, they continued with their clients in Compulsion's analysis, recognizing a shared sense of spirituality. Compulsion's analysis becomes the process as a consequence. Robert sheds his surname and becomes Robert de Grimston, which was an idea by uh, Marianne. As she, she, she started to sort of engineer him into this Growing his hair longer and sort of a goatee into this more charismatic dark figure and she she did so brilliantly. Now in sixty six the process establishes the heads headquarters at two Belfour Place in London's upscale Mayfair district and the process becomes a community. Now, this is where they started meeting a lot of influential people. I'm talking about the Rolling Stones, because they would have these open sessions in, during this period in, in Mayfair in 66. And this is right. And so, so you know, the Rolling Stones, it, Mick Jagger is in one of the process magazines. Because they met, they met everyone, and they would wear these sort of black robes. And the chaos magician, who and, and a lot of the art in in, in, in this is very inspired by um, um, Austin Osmond Spare and Ramsey Dukes, a very prominent chaos magician. He um, showed up in Mayfair in the 60s to try and get in and he had to run in with uh, and um, no one was there so he showed up another time and there was a processian in their black robes and the four the very swastika looking symbol that they use but it represents different archetypes that they use in their analysis and he he uh, he, he told them where were you you meant to be here you know last week or were, and the Processian said to uh, to Ramsey Dukes um, that you know um, maybe maybe in your reality, and then shut him down. <laughs> they they started pissing off a lot of the London establishment, though. And so in 1966, approximately 30 Processians, together with six German Shepherd dogs, this is very important later down the line, moved to Nassau in the Bahamas in June. The community then moved to Mexico after three months. So they've now become a cult. They're no longer compulsions, anal convulsions analysis. They're now the process. And so then they went go to Mexico after three months. In September, they traveled to the coastal village of Sicil on the Yucatan Peninsula. And from there, established themselves on a deserted estate of a ruined salt factory called Extul. And uh, Robert de Grimston has a whole series of writings called the... I, I can't really pronounce it very well. I'm sorry, de Grimston. Um, the... Uxtul or XTUL dialogues. Then a hurricane strikes the U Yucatan on October 7th. The process moves back to London, leaving a small contingual in Ixtul. The first coffee house is opened in the basement of Belfort Place. Now, this hurricane that almost destroyed the cult compound caused, in a mass channeling session, Robert de Grimston to get a, a... and a lot of other people involved in the process a very psychedelic, very apocalyptic, very satanic revelation style but inversed it's this this something changed 
after this hurricane. This was the focal point that created the process. Now, the process magazine, the common market issue, is printed and sold in 67 on the streets of London. The magazine is also distributed to each member of the House of Commons. That's, that's how much gall they had. They were... Now, Robert de Grimsby and Mary Ann set off on their travels through the Middle East. It's something I did not know until recently. Um, in April, arriving in Israel in May, in June they arrive in Turkey, and Robert writes his first of his apocalyptic books, completing as it is, and a candle in hell. Process Magazine publishes the freedom of expression and the mind-benders issue. Processians from Ixtal move to New Orleans, America, baby, and they open their first chapter on the Royal Street in the French Quarter. Mary Ann and Robert move to Louisiana and settle in a small house in Slidell. Now, the bulk of the community remains at London, and the art department produces the next two issues of the Process Magazine, the book that drug addiction is published. Now, this is 1967, New Orleans, and this is when they fu the process becomes incorporated in Louisiana as the Process Church of the Final Judgment. This is 67, this is where things start getting really interesting. Now, the, the, they have the book Drug Addiction because, like, Scientology and a lot of other cults, and this is, this is 67, methamphetamine is flooding, flooding America, uh, methadrine crystal, as they used to call it, and LSD and heroin and... But it and dexedrine, dexamphetamine, but amphetamines fueled the sixties. It fueled the music. It fueled the counterculture. In fact, because the bands had to play for so long, everyone was taking dexedrine. Everyone was taking it. The Beatles, everyone, um, LSD, and all that came in. But it was really speed that fueled the fucking 60s, not LSD. And in particular, methadrine. So they get in, they're bringing in a lot of drug addicts, getting them clean. They're doing a lot of tricks that Scientology liked to pull off. Now that they're the final judgment, they open in 67, their first chapter in San Francisco in December. The New Orleans chapters close and the community moves briefly to Los Angeles in February. This is extremely important. During this period in 67, 68, of course, this is Manson family. This is where... Roman Polanski, Sharon Tate, you got fucking, um, you know, David Bowie. Now, they, they didn't just publish the book Drug Addiction. They wanted to bring drug addicts in because cocaine in that time period, too, it was becoming very, very big. Even though people associate coke with the 70s, it was, you know, cocaine, people were doing coke in the West more than a century ago. Crawley wrote the majority of his work, sleeping four hours a day and doing coke 16 to 18, constantly. And so they were selling drugs to, processians were selling coke, they were selling meth, adrenaline and... And now selling them to celebrities. Quaaludes, too, another big one. Barbiturates, Nebutol, Luminol. So now that they're in San Francisco, they've got all these junkies, and then you've got David Bowie doing, using the Goetia snorting coke, creating his personality, fractured actor, 
because his entire personality fractured during that period because of coke psychosis and goetic rituals he was doing. Um, they were selling, they were associating with everyone because everybody knew everyone. All the drug dealers running around the, in high society, you know, Manson associated with helping create the fucking Beach Boys sound. Manson was also Scientology. He was cleared in Scientology. Manson is always considered to be associated with the process by conspiracy theorists. Now, the process like to say that they had nothing to do with Manson. They, uh, the interview with Manson was done after, blah, blah, blah. But Manson came from the same circles with regards to Scientology. There's a connection with... Because during this period, the amount of murders going on within Scientology in uh, after the Manson family shit went down was insane. In I'm talking about 250 Scientologists were killed in um, in California in just a very short period after Manson was. Um, after the, yeah, a La Bianca, uh, Sharon Tate murder. So there was some internal war going on within the Church of Scientology at that time. It was, and, and a lot of people were getting killed. And Processians were in amongst all this because they, most were ex-Scientology, as I said, almost all the brilliant fucking minds of this period were associated with Scientology in the 60s. Burrow, William S. Burroughs for 10 years, who later became involved with the process, as I mentioned earlier. Anyway, they, they um... They start get, trying in Europe, and they move around a lot. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And essentially, the process... They... had to rebrand themselves after the Manson family murders, essentially. because of their inadvertent associations. But ro this is where things get a bit murky. Um, in the 70s, things start to change in a sort of uh, 1974 where the Process Church of the Final Judgment, Robert steps back a bit more, but I'm not quite sure about this because Robert de Grimston, his, his work is very sacred to him. And these guys were involved with um, the Cambridge, uh, sorry, London School of Economics and Cambridge and where, where MI5 and MI6 recruit. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, Jean Lecoeur shit. There's a reason I go into this, and all their work is full of neurolinguistics, repetitive repeating of information. It's uh, to to. It's it's amazing. Um, they then became the foundation church of the millennial, and then they became <coughs> the foundation faith of the millennial. They kept changing and changing. However, where things start getting interesting is not that... Uh, essentially, they to, make, to simplify things, a lot moved to New York, and then a certain event happened that made everything... and got me interested in the process. Um, which is, of course, the Son of Sam killings. 
David Berkowitz. 44 caliber killer. Son of Sam. He motive misogyny. No. The mo he 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 outright says the motive. It was to it was um human sacrifice to bring forth to speed up the apocalypse. Yet the process, Church of the Final Judgment, were all about aeonics. They were all about uh, the unification of Christ and Satan. Now, Berkowitz, he held the city hostage From around 1975 to 77, technically, there's a, a few other things associated with Berkowitz people don't really know, but where the Son of Sam stuff really kicked off was uh, 77. And it was dispassionate. They just... He used a very specific... Um, you know, Berkowitz was an ex-U.S. Marine. Like, he was... He was a soldier. And he, he started hanging out with occultists after... Um, he... He did his uh, tour in the United States U.S. Marine Corps. And, you know, he, he became a postman. And he he was lonely. He uh, had absolutely no friends. He was very and he hung out in a place called Yonkers, where a investigative journalist called Maury Terry grew up. And this is where. I found out about the process, which is um, when Maury Terry interviewed David Berkowitz, I believe in the 90s. I've had arguments with so many people about the process and Son of Sam. Now, there's a Netflix documentary about the search for the Sons of Sam by a director, Joshua Zeman, who starts off doing a very good job and then becomes a complete prick and discredits everything Maury Terry has done over being wrong about the motive of one thing even though he was right about so much like Maury yeah, um, it's a shame because they, they could have done a fantastic job it's a absolutely for me the documentary is worth it's worth watching the Netflix documentary series The Sons of Sam because but the the people they bring in are absolutely useless the the occult experts and all these dickheads and the these condescending pricks It's a shame that a, a different director wasn't involved in this, and different writer. However, one good thing came out of the Netflix documentary, and that is... Maury Terry's book, The Ultimate Evil, The Search for... Oh, it was just called The Ultimate Evil. It was out of print. I couldn't get it anywhere. You know, I, I was looking for this book forever. It's been reprinted. At the beginning, the documentary filmmaker 
he writes the most absolutely disgusting introduction I have ever read at the beginning of a book written by a dead man who actually put everything in to try and find the truth in the son of Sam Dave Berkowitz serial killings and the even though Maury Terry inevitably inadvertently created the satanic panic of the 80s he was not a tabloid sensationalist Maury Terry was a very very interesting man who diet was coffee and cigarettes and running around with satanic Scientologists and trying to uh, uh, doing my investigation to the order of nine angles uh, it had a lot of um, interesting parallels with Maury Terry's work I sometimes felt like Maury Terry running around New York chasing after the children and the d different groups associated with the Son of Sam killings getting led into all these different directions trying to find out what's going on and sadly because credibility is everything these days if you're if you the thing is though any with with journalism these days especially investigative journalism or analytical journalism if you're not part of the establishment the establishment is going to treat you like absolute shit if you are part of the establishment you're going to get no contacts because nobody in the underground is involved in terrorism involved in neo-nazis involved in satanism i'm talking about involved in you know and you know pr child prostitution rings all kinds of shit snuff films because they 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 there was a lot going on, a lot going on in this period. It was in absolute turmoil and the process were involved in all of it, just like they were everywhere they, they went because they knew all the drug dealers, they knew they brought them in. But you can't control what small groups of people do with your ideas and methodologies. Technically, uh, under the Australian counterterrorism laws, if anyone is radicalized by my work, i.e. if your intention is to help people or give information that is useful, and in, uh, and, or if your intention is to de-escalate or de-accelerationist in extremist movements towards more... How should I put this... Uh, socially positive outcomes for the individuals involved to not do s stupid things to get more information on what is how to avoid manipulation and control by Asian provocateurs and infiltrators to step away from the more sensational stupid elements of things and into what the belief systems are really about if somebody essentially watches one of my videos and goes oh they've got a good point but you know then goes and kills someone I can be charged with recklessness and uh, a 20 year prison sentence My lawyers, because of the Australian counterterrorism laws, I, I, I refer to them as the, the four pillars of the CT laws, a reference to the five pillars of Islam that I have to follow, like a good Muslim should follow the five pillars. I have to follow the four pillars of the Australian CT laws. 
Because even if an organisation isn't designated as a terrorist organisation, although the ONA is going through Parliament to be one, or has been for the past couple of years, say in the UK, you can be, and it's not paranoia, it's just something you have to deal with, arrested for national security purposes, disappeared with no one being contacted for 72 hours where no lawyer is even allowed and charged with terrorism for something stupid somebody does even if it has absolutely even if the only connection is, is they uh, subscribe to you on youtube they can use that as a means to charge you even though it's stupid and there's a lot of ways to get around that because unless they directly name you but it's ridiculous but you have no protection and so the mainstream journalists nobody will talk to them they can't get good contacts that's why they're rubbish because they all, all they want to do is expose so the only people that get interviews that get communications with people in the background are people like Maury Terry and myself people who are not part of the establishment because well, we have no protection. We're not here to... We're just trying to work out what's going on. And if you have a track record of not fucking people over, generally you do okay. So you're never going to be taken seriously by the establishment. That's why they try and... So you might hear about the process. So if you have in The Ultimate Evil, in the Netflix documentary, but that's just as biased as watching a Processian documentary. If, in fact, the Processian documentary on YouTube, I highly recommend it, is far more, far less biased, even though they disconnect themselves from the Manson and the process. Sorry, and Manson and Berkowitz. Anyway, the... I do recommend the Ultimate Evil because these groups did exist and did function during this period and I feel that the process Church of the Final Judgment is incredibly relevant to the work I've been doing because It is literally the, before I knew the ONA even existed, I've gone through all of their material. It's fantastic. So essentially the process, the main symbol is pretty much a swastika, but it's 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 the, the belief system, which is what I'm going to go into in the, in the next podcast. Now that there is a, good understanding of kind of their basic history oh and when the process actually split up what's interesting is they've always owned german shepherds and marianne she um create there's a uh, the process became the foundation faith after the berkowitz stuff abandoning Manhattan headquarters in 1978, so after the Son of Sam killings. Robert de Grimson in 79 gives up on recreating the process. And, um, the Foundation relocates to Utah and creates the Best Friends Animal Sanctuary, which still exists to this very day. So the Best Friends Animal Sanctuary, which was also associated with a... I think, oh, I forgot what it was called. There was an American TV series on like um, dog shelters that was owned by them. Now they no longer appear to be a spiritual or religious community. Uh, Marianne died in 2005, 
Robert de Grimston is still alive, living back in Shanghai. He is 88 years old. If you're alive, Robert de Grimston, I'm not very far away from you. I would love to correspond. So, the process are extremely relevant because like the Order of Nine Angles and other groups and different and far-right groups like the Atomwaffen Division, neo-Nazi groups, during a time of flower power and everything and, you know, the process of going around talking about bringing on the apocalypse to hasten a new aeon through magical and through the unification of Christ and Satan because they held that God is made of four separate parts equally worthy of worship Jehovah, Christ, Lucifer and Satan and that's why there's the swastika like symbol that they use representing these forces and that a person must worship all four in succession to gain enlightenment that's a bad quote it everybody has a separate with these archetypes they use so lucifer jehovah and satan they are three paths and each individual has an association with Lucifer or Jehovah or Satan a bit more than the other. And so the point is using these archetypes, which are real and not real at the same time, is to hold, um, is essentially Identify, to know yourself, identify yourself with these archetypes. And then it goes beyond that and it goes into where it's sort of there's the Christ essence in the center, there's Satan associated more with the soul, and then Jehovah the mind, image of the soul, Satan again, the body, and then going back into Lucifer the mind, the image of the body. I will go in the next podcast into processy and material because I've got all of it. I've, I love it. I played some of it, which is sounds very sinister with the computer voice reading it out. But um, at the very beginning, but they saw what was going on and unlike the hippies they took an active role in doing what doing aeonics they wanted to speed up the apocalypse that they saw was coming and then in the remnants of the ruin that's why it's this is the final judgment to then rebuild so essentially it, a more extreme and apocalyptic language version of a lot of Order of Nine Angles original manuscripts from the 1970s and 80s, which is why I'm still pissed off certain contacts that I know had some connection to the process. As conspiratorial as that sounds, with the Order of Nine Angles in the UK... There's a lot of similarities with the sinister dialectic and with process, but the process is far more overt back then and far more established. And Jehovah's archetype is, was, is uh, people who are very authoritarian, and what's right is right, and... Then there's the more Luciferian, aesthetically inclined uh, uh, people that are very 
more uh, artistic, but I also can be quite vain and <laughs> exit chapter two B I five the cycle of ignorance goes into a lot of the issues of the Luciferian elements of the personality construct that people fall into the cycles go around in circles people who are more satan orientated associated with violence and you you're meant to embrace who you are if you are and and explore this if you're a th and they did all kinds of things. They experimented with channeling, narcotics, magic, fucking e-meters and Scientology methods, neuro-linguistic programming. Robert de Grimson's writings and works and are essentially will repeat the same message over and over again word for word in some element in some parts and you got to remember this is back in the 60s people weren't as bombarded with neuro-linguistic programming and with social engineering to this extent of overt in in such an overt nature and in the ruin of the civilization. So the Son of Sam connection, the Manson connection, you know, Helter Skelter, it's all very Processian, but taken very literally. Now I'd have to talk to de Grimston. I'd have to talk to, if he's still alive, Timothy Wiley, if, if some elements, the splintered off from different chapters of Processian groups took things in too much of a Satan direction or, and started killing in order to... Because the, 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 the process connection with Manson was meant to be that, oh, de Grimston is the real person behind Manson or Manson is the real head of the process, which is not true. Manson's just Manson. De Grimston is... It, it could be a coincidence that they came up with similar ideas, just De Grimston is far more subtle about its initiation, but it... It... Yeah, so Niners people who don't know, people in the order of nine angles um, for themselves in nine is a lot. Uh, the, these guys really focused on the sinister dialectic. <laughs> anyway, this is Into Zone Analysis Insight Analytica episode three, the Process Church of the Final Judgment. An introduction part one. I am not saying that the process is behind all of this, but things get hijacked and people do things. But the material and even Berkowitz himself in interviews doesn't really have a reason to lie about it, to be honest. And all these connections, they're very interesting, and a lot of these cults come from, of course, the intelligence services. And yeah, I'm a bit unwell, so if it's been a little bit erratic and scattered, just have a fever at the moment, but this is a passion project of mine, and I look forward into going into 1960s and 70s satanic Scientologists and how the Omega the two enigmatic people caused so much social change yet 
very few people even know of their existence. And I hope I've come at this at a relatively objective angle. And Robert de Grimston, don't die. Last Processians, don't die. I would love to get more information if possible on what actually happened because this is really the last chance any of you will have to ever do so. So take care. Regards, I A.